Well, it might not be morning where you are, so hello. Uh, and thank you for viewing this Zoom video and taking a few minutes to be present with one another today. You know, this session is one in a series of conversational interviews and some quiet sitting with various members of the Dominican family. Each session uh, tries to aim to give us a, a peek at what moves these individuals forward at a time like this in our history and in our common mission as Dominicans. What does occupy their daily thoughts as they each live very full, prayerful lives in service to the people God sends their way? Again, especially during this unprecedented time, a time that, if we're honest, will not soon be forgotten, uh, and a time, if we let it, that is teaching us so much about ourselves globally, as well as up close here on Long Island. So let's begin. I'm Sister Mary Pat Nalen, and my conversation partner for this br brief session today is Mr. Margaret. Margaret. That's right. Welcome, Margaret. Thank it's really great to have you part of this. Uh, oh, it's and great now, to uh, this, good. <laughs> uh, and now, a little bit about ourselves in case there's anybody out there who doesn't know us. Margaret, would you begin and tell us a little bit of, about how your life has uh, gone? Well, 62 years ago, I entered our community and was teaching and being a principal for about 26 years. And then I began to move more into doing community work. 22 years ago, I was invited to come out to the East End of Long Island to work with the Hispanic community. And I've been out here ever since, learning and sharing and growing with them. Wow, oh, that's great. And there's a lot, I think, inside those few brief sentences that you gave us about yourself that uh, would certainly uh, be a, worth a very long conversation sometime. Anyway, Margaret, that's great. Uh, and as for myself, I've really been pretty solidly in the Ministry of Education on all levels through almost uh, all close to 59 years of my membership in the congregation. Um, most recently, though, uh, history found me serving our sisters in congregational leadership. And that was such a marvelous, if not humbling, experience for me to be at the heart of a congregation serving women whose very lives are just steeped in service. So I'm um, also now doing some volunteer work in, with missions and ministries that are similar to ours as Dominicans. And uh, all sorts of new things are opening up. So it's wonderful. Uh, and Margaret, back to the uh, question at hand, with the current pan pandemic um, highlighting the plight of so many globally, as well as right here on Long Island, with that in mind, as you work with the Latino population along a good 30 miles of the North Fork, how are you finding the pandemic to be impacting our local Latino sisters and brothers? Well, it's very hard to even imagine how difficult life has become for so many people. Right now, as we're talking, people are outside my doors. We have a long line going for food pantry and we're feeding people who are food unstable and need the help for that. People are coming because they're fearful of being put out of their homes because they don't have employment in order to pay for rent. Mm -hmm. This week, well, not this week today, but up to this week, um, I've helped the hospital bury three people wow. who have died of the virus and working with them and with their families and connecting to try to make sure that they are getting a respectful welcoming to the home of the Lord. And so, and this morning alone, I've had three groups come in who worked and have not been paid. And so there's also frauding things that are going on within the community that are making life difficult for people who are trying to survive. So it's creating an all-round problem and people are not sure 
of what's going to come next in their lives. Sounds like fear. Sounds a little bit like, uh, you know, advocacy work is uh, a very much larger part of your job out there than it had been in the past. You know, you're dipping into so many things, which uh, are, are needs of the people. Even some basic things, like it's announced all over that children are on laptops so they can work at home. But many wow. times we forget that they have to be connected to Wi-Fi and we don't have access for some of the families for Wi-Fi. So there's groups of us working with the legislators to see what we can do with the companies to be able to provide Wi-Fi services to all those who are underserved for that. Yes. Oh, it's, it's good to know that you are there as a go-to person, you know, for so many of the Latino population. Uh, there's, uh, you know, I really believe that you are a go the go-to person uh, for so many, and you are uh, an essential worker. So, uh, you know, that there's so many, so much said about our essential workers and the people who are on the front lines to help others. So uh, we see, I see you very much in uh, that line, in that role, role for our Latino people. Um, you know, so with, as being an essential person, um, do you see any new, or and maybe my, the word might be uh, increasing difficulties that you and your staff of volunteers, you know, encounter on a daily basis that you didn't used to encounter seven, year, seven weeks ago or so? when uh, this all, all started for us? Anything new and different? Well, first of all, one of the things is the number of people being affected by the virus is growing. Okay. I don't even have my secretary here because she has the, had the virus. Oh. And her daughter and fiance and everybody has had it. Thank God they're recovering and they're okay. So the number of people in the Hispanic community is increasing on the East End and throughout Long Island. Mm -hmm. We don't even have all the volunteers you need okay. because people are fearful of leaving their homes because yeah. volunteers usually mean older people okay. who have time that sure. they can donate. And they're more susceptible. And they're more susceptible. Right. So it oh. becomes a little difficult to get lots of people to come in and help out. Right. That's a very uh, big problem. And would there be another reason why people wouldn't come out besides the disease that's the virus like perhaps they are, they don't have the right paperwork, uh, that they're immigrants? Yeah. Part of that is true. I've had people say to me in the last week that they didn't apply for food or come for food or apply for help for food stamps because of all those laws that were passed for public charge. Wow. And they were afraid that if they went to try to get food to eat, that they would be then penalized by our government, even deported. So yes. they were choosing to eat less wow. and suffer. And so to communicate that out to the community, that that's suspended for now. Okay. And it's okay, you've got to be healthy and stay healthy yes. and come and have food. Right. I know that, uh, I guess a week or so ago when I was speaking with you, you said that uh, like Island Cares and other operations like that, you know, had food to bring to other food banks. Well, are you able to take advantage of those things too for your... Uh, Absolutely. Good. We are blessed with uh, Long Island Cares. In fact, I have a sign in my car that says I'm an essential worker for them. <laughs> Good. And... Um, we have Island Harvest. We have uh, people who just come constantly. Shoprite uh -huh. came in yesterday and bought us pies and cakes, and, and because it's nice to not only bag basic food, but it's wonderful to put a couple of cupcakes into a bag too, and it makes people smile a little bit because it's not all painful that you need a can of peas. Yes. But you can also have a cupcake for supper, too, with your dinner. Sure, sure. You're bringing out all of that, exactly. Um, I was wondering, you know, then, with all of these things that you mentioned, um, what, as, as you work in this um, environment, 
you know, what gives you hope and what, what do you see gives them hope uh, that there's um, a light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak? Well, I'd like to start out by saying the faith of the people makes my faith grow a little bit stronger every day. The fact that they trust so much in our Lord, be able to provide for what they need and to protect them. Father told me this morning, our pastor, he found one of our Spanish couples kneeling in front of the church this morning, praying together. And we have the doors open so they can actually go in, but they didn't know that. But they were kneeling out there praying. People are faithful. This has given great spirit to so many people who are donating. People walk in with food, with uh, donations of money, with what can we do for our neighbor? How can we help them? That it makes it just a wonderful experience of saying, maybe out of that which is difficult will grow something really wonderful for our future too. I'm saying goodbye to my volunteers for leaving right now. Okay. All right. We'll wave too sometime. Um, that's, yeah, that's, and so then I would think that what you just said about them, their faith, that, that their faith gives you hope also. Absolutely. It is just one, and they're caring. Uh -huh. People are checking up on people. Uh, they right. even call me and check up uh -huh. and say, are you okay? And then they say, well, this person, we went and checked on them. We made sure somebody else got food out of the food that we had. Yes. It's a wonderful sense of community building yes. in spite of troubles. So do you go out or do your volunteers go out and do some of the shopping that if you get money donations and, uh, you know, how are they, uh, how are all those donations being used? And do you still have a, a well-stocked food bank yourself? We have a pretty well stocked food bank. We've been able to open five days a week right? so that people don't have to worry about wait till Tuesday. We're open five days a week and we provide enough for the family to come and they can always return. And we right. do have volunteers that do the shopping. And then one of the wonderful ecumenical things is uh, churches, other churches that don't have them focus their support on a church that does have it. Right. So they have their parishioners collecting at their church and then they bring it to us. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're what you're all telling, working together. Right, that's what you're telling me is, is the bottom line that seems to be coming out from out there where you are, as well as us in Nassau County and uh, parts of Suffolk and Queens you know, and Brooklyn, we're just all finding out that helping one another is a key ingredient to helping ourselves. Absolutely. And so uh, Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a very, um, uh, very interesting and difficult time for all of us, but we're finding ways to rise above some of the negativity and some of the difficulties of, of what's happening to all of us around the globe. Um, um, I was wondering about fear. Um, does that play much of a role in, besides what you earlier said, uh, in um, you know, the lives of the people that you're working with? Very much. One of the biggest fears, not so much the food because they know that, we'll, that we can find food. One of the biggest yes. fears is eviction. Mm -hmm. People yeah. are really scared that without a job and an income, that when that three month protection is over, Right. what's going to happen. Right. So you said efficacy before. Yeah. So now I see it as part of our mission mm -hmm. to join with other agencies and work out a process and with the political scene yeah. on how we can figure out to keep people safely in their homes mm -hmm. for the long term. Yeah. It's going to be a pretty big job but it's a job that absolutely has to be done because people come and say, can I be on the street with my children in another month? That's a big, big fear that people have right now. Big fear. So that's definitely something that's going to see your role out there evolving into uh, more of the, the housing uh, 
criteria that will be needed to be set up for people to find uh, a home, not just a house, but a home that they can really That's right. uh, raise their children in. Um, you know, there's a, as we, we come to the end of our time together, is there a message that you would like to give to those viewing this video session today? You know, I was thinking about this so many different times and in one of the internet masses that I've been watching, uh, one Sunday they were singing um, about how even if I walk in the valley of shadows and death, I shall not fear because the Lord is always with me. And that's a message of hope because we are the presence of the Lord here on earth. And seeing all these people and more to come yes. that are putting themselves out to help people mm -hmm. to do so many wonderful things spurs a, a whole seed of hope in, in so many people's lives. And so yes. to know that that exists and right. to have that hope growing in everybody mm -hmm. is just a gift that right. we are able to give and share with each other. Great, thank you, Margaret. And, uh, and, thanking, and you know, thank you for helping us, you know, hear firsthand about the lives of those who are close by us, because we can see so much about the global level on television, but it's often not uh, you know, clear to us truly what's happening unless a particular story is being done on, you know, channel 12 or something. So, uh, we're, but when we're very glad to have your comforting presence out there on the North Fork, because you know, as oh. we've all said, where one of us is, we all are. So uh, thank are. you for being, yes. And it's uh, a gift yeah. for me in my life to be out here to share it with the people. Oh, geez, that's wonderful. So um, at this point, we'd like to uh, pause for a couple of minutes of stillness and quiet to let what we just heard find a home in us. Uh, we want to open our hearts to the divine presence in and around us, alive in the prayer and the work that each of us does. So let's take some time of quiet and silence.
So let us allow the risen Jesus to embrace us and the work that each one of us does in some way to lighten the suffering of others. We pray. Gracious God, bless us in our weakness and in our fear, as well as in our trust and in our hope. We place before you the virus present in our world in so many forms. And we acknowledge the wisdom of scientists, doctors, caregivers, service providers. Continue to gift them with compassion and generosity in helping to care for those who are ill and those at risk. Help us to help those who feel lost in their search for work, housing, safety, and food. Comfort those who have lost a loved one. Assist us to know how to best reach out to one another in compassion and in your all-embracing love. Amen. So we thank you, Margaret, again. Blessings on you and your work and the people you encounter. And thank all of you out there in video land for watching this video and praying with us for whatever we can each do in our own way to lessen some of the pain and difficulty of this time and to increase the hope we have to offer by our very lives with one another. Thank you.